So credit cards are not money because credit cards don't represent an asset. Credit cards represent a liability. They represent something that you owe to someone else. And, and money has to be an asset that can be used to pay for goods and services. All right. Now, how is money created? By banks. Now, banks, banks are institutions that do a bunch of things. So Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Mechanics Bank, whichever bank you want to put in your head, that's fine. Banks are institutions that accept deposits. So you go down and you say, here's a check I got from my grandma, and you put it in your account, and they say, thank you very much, they accept that deposit. Banks make loans. You go down to the bank, you say, I want to buy a car, they say, sit right down here, we'll fill out the paperwork, and they make you a loan. Banks are institutions that earn profit. They are not charitable institutions, they're businesses whose goal is to maximize profit. So a bank is a business whose goal is to maximize profit. They make profit, they earn profit by charging you for the privilege of taking out loans from them. So if the bank lends you $10,000 to buy a used car, you're going to give them back more than $10,000. And that extra that you pay back, the interest that you pay back to the bank, that's part of their revenue, and that's the source of their profit. And finally, a bank is an institution that holds reserves, term, holds reserves, which will be equal to a fraction, not equal to the entirety of, but equal to a fraction of their total deposits. I'm going to unpack this sentence in just a minute. Equal to a fraction of their deposits, and they hold these reserves in order to cover your withdrawals. Now I'm going to take the next three slides to unpack that and this. Banks create money. Banks create money by making loans with something that's called their excess reserves. Banks create money by making loans with their excess reserves. The money they create is balances in checking accounts. Remember that money is coins and currency, yeah, which is a small part, less than 10%, and the balance we have in our checking account. Money, coins, currency, eh, and primarily the balance in our checking account. That's money. Banks create money. They increase the total amount of money in the economy by making loans with something called their excess reserves. I'll unpack this in just a second. By making loans with their excess reserves. The printing press is completely irrelevant. So I know there's great pictures on the news about the printing press, and they talk about money creation, they talk about the money supply going up, and they'll always show the printing press, right? And they'll show these huge sheets of dollar bills, or in this case, $20 bills coming off the printing press. <laughs> Completely irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. When we talk about money creation, the printing press is irrelevant. When we talk about money creation, we're talking about banks making loans with their excess reserves. Let's unpack it. All right. So banks, checking accounts, bank accounts, checking accounts, same difference. A bank account, a checking account. There's also a phrase transaction account. So they're also sometimes called transaction accounts. So you can talk about bank accounts. You can use the phrase bank accounts. You can use the phrase checking accounts. Or you can use the phrase transaction accounts. It doesn't really matter. All three of these are the same thing. Okay. So here you are. I'll make you happy. There's you. There you are. And you have a checking account at some bank. I don't care what bank it is. We'll call it at your bank. That's the name of it. Your bank. My bank is Bank of America. Yours is called your bank. All right. So you have some account at your bank. The relationship that you have with your bank is you do a couple of things. One thing you do is you make deposits into your bank. So you go down and you give them uh, cash or you give them a check and that's a deposit that increases the balance in your account. The other thing that you give your bank is you give your bank orders to pay. You order your bank to pay someone else. You say, your bank, because that's the name of your bank. Your bank, I order you to pay $800 to my landlord. And your bank says, okay. And your bank pays $800 to your landlord. Now you're thinking, I don't order my bank around. Sure you do. It looks like this. It says, pay to the order of, you're ordering your bank to pay money to whomever this check is written out to. You perhaps pay your bills online, or you perhaps haven't started paying your bills yet. That's not good. You need to get the whole personal finance thing worked out because we're not going to teach you that, so you've got to figure that out at home. So this is what a check looks like. We'll start with that. This is what a check looks like. So you're going to write to the landlord. You're going to date it. You're going to write it out, say $800 a month because you got one little itty-bitty room in half of the studio. Eight hundred and no one hundredth dollars. You're going to write down, this is for my rent, as if you didn't know that. You're going to sign it. It's not my signature, but you know, there you go. And you're going to give that check to your landlord. That check, that piece of paper, is your order to your bank to pay your landlord $800. You may be doing this online. You may go online and you may have your landlord as one of your payees and you may check that and put $800 in the box and then check pay too. It's the exact same thing. That's just electronic instead of using a good old fashioned check. If you look at your checks, there's a couple of numbers along the bottom. This one here, the bank routing number, that's a number that's associated. You know how you have an SID? You are your SID, right? So each bank has a number and that bank's number is like their SID. It's the number by which we know the bank and that's called the bank routing number. Bank of America is like 12100358 weird trivia that's in my head. And then there's the bank account number, and this is you. This is your account number at the bank, and then there's a number that's the check number on the bank. You give this check to your landlord, and the check, the landlord takes the check, goes down, deposits it probably at the ATM, or maybe taking a picture of it, doesn't matter either way, goes down, deposits this check into the landlord's checking account, and the receiving bank, your landlord's bank, is going to scan the bottom of the check, and it's going to know from those numbers which bank this check was drawn on. And then your landlord's bank is going to get the funds moved from your bank into your landlord's bank. This movement of funds between banks Movement of funds between banks, between accounts and between banks, happens now electronically. So there's not somebody with a, a pen and a paper anymore. There used to be. Happens electronically. Happens on demand. So what distinguishes a checking account from something else is that the bank can't say, "We will honor your check in five days." Then you say, "I want you to pay my landlord today." They have to pay the landlord today. They can't put it. They can't tell you that you can't write a check uh, on your account. And these checks are cleared through the clearinghouse. So there's a clearinghouse that gets the funds from your bank to your landlord's bank. And in the United States, that clearinghouse is the Federal Reserve Bank. So those 12 different Federal Reserve banks around the country, one of the big reasons they were initially created was to clear funds between banks to so facilitate this process of transferring funds from you, who bank at your bank, to landlord's bank, which is a different bank. That's what the Fed does. Well, at your bank, your bank has a list of all of the people who bank at your bank. It has you, and it knows what your balance is. Maybe I bank there too, so it has me, and has my balance. It has him over there, and has his balance. It has her, it has that balance. And they can add up the total balances in all of those accounts, and that would be one number that would be the total deposits that are held at that bank. So they could do that any time, right? They could just look at what your balance is right this minute. They could look at it at 5 o'clock today. They could do it once a week. They could do it once a month. In fact, they do it all the time. And that would come up with, that would give them the total deposits that are held in the bank. So the bank has a list of who has accounts, keeps track of it by the account numbers. And those are the various me, you, him, and her. Your bank, in the same sense in which you have an account at your bank, in the same sense in which you have an account at your bank, your bank has an account at the Federal Reserve Bank. You have an account at your bank, it's called your checking account. Your bank has an account at the Fed, and it's called their reserve account. It's very, very similar. 
to your checking account. You have an account at the bank, we'll call that your bank account or your checking account. Your bank has an account at the Fed, and that's called the bank's reserve account. So that's the official lingo. It's called the reserve account. It's held at the Federal Reserve Bank. It's the reserve account. The balances in those reserve accounts are used to move funds between banks. The balances in those reserve accounts are used to move funds between banks. So let's go back to you and your landlord. So here you are. There's you. I'll make you happy. You wrote a check, and you gave that $800 check to your landlord. Your landlord took that check and deposited it at we'll call it LL Bank. Landlord Bank. Your landlord took that check and deposited, ooh, I'm running out of space, deposited the check at Landlord Bank. Landlord Bank scanned the check, looked at those numbers along the bottom, and it used to be they actually physically sent the check back. Now they just do it all electronically, so they scan it in a PDF and send it that way. So they send the check back to your bank, and your bank tells the Fed, yo, Fed, tells the Fed to transfer some reserves from your bank's reserve account into Landlord Bank's reserve account. And that's how the $800 get from your bank to your Landlord's bank and into your Landlord's account. So you write a check, you give it to your landlord, your landlord deposits it at Landlord Bank. Landlord Bank scans the check, recognizes the check is from, from your bank, your bank tells the Fed, you better transfer $800 from your bank's reserve account into Landlord Bank's reserve account. And that's why Landlord Bank is willing to put $800 into the Landlord's account. And that's why your bank takes $800 out of your account. Because that $800 has to get to the Landlord somehow. So those reserves are used to move the funds between banks. They're used to cover uh, checks. Well, imagine, everybody can imagine writing a check when you don't have enough funds to cover the check and having the check bounce and then you have to call home and you have that whole awful relationship, phone call and so on. Imagine if you had plenty of money in your checking account to cover your check, but your bank didn't have enough in its reserve account to cover the check. So you had like $2,000 in your checking account, more than enough to cover an $800 check to your landlord. But when they got to this point in the process, when your bank said, yo, Fed, transfer $800 to landlord bank, imagine what if the Fed said to your bank, yo, bank, you don't have $800 in your reserve account. I can't transfer $800 from your bank to landlord's bank. And then your rent check bounces, not because you don't have enough funds in your account, but because your bank doesn't have enough funds in its reserve account, I'm guessing you would be pretty unhappy. Right? So we have an incentive, you and I who are the customers of the banks, we have an incentive to make sure that our banks keep a big enough balance in that reserve account to be able to cover all of the checks that we write. Now, it turns out that most of us don't drain our checking accounts every day. Most of us don't write a check that covers the entire balance of our checking account on any given day. And so if the banks have a reserve account balance that is at least 10%, 10% of the total number of deposits, so that total where they add up me, you, him, her, the total amount of, of, of funds held in checking accounts, if the banks keep at least 10% of that amount in their reserves, that's enough to cover all of the checks that we want to clear on any given day. And so the banks are required by law to keep a balance in their reserve account that is at least equal to 10% of the total checking account balances. So that total, when you add up all of the balances in everybody's account, they have to have at least 10% of that in their reserve account. That's called required reserves. That's wrong button. Anything beyond that 10%, anything beyond that minimum requirement is called their excess reserves. So their excess reserves is just equal to the total reserves, that's the balance in their, in their reserve account, bless you, balance in their reserve account minus their required reserves. So minus the 10%, and that equals excess reserves. ER is a pretty common shorthand for excess reserves. Banks are in the business of making profit. Banks are profit-maximizing institutions. They earn profit by making loans because they're going to charge you for the privilege of lending you money. Banks don't want to hold on to excess reserves. Those excess reserves are just sitting there. They could do something with that that would increase the profitability of the bank. And so what do banks want to do with those excess reserves? Well, typically, what the banks want to do with those excess reserves is they want to make loans. Typically, the banks don't want to hold on to excess reserves because they're not earning anything on those excess reserves. The whole point of being a banker is to make profit. And what they can do is they can earn profit by making loans. When they make those loans, they also create money. So here you are. You're the borrower. Well, I'll make you a little less happy because you're borrowing money. So there you are. You're borrowing money. So there you are. You've gone down to the bank and you're borrowing money. And there is, of course, a very happy loan officer at the bank who's over there ready to make you a loan because they're going to make some profit off of you. And you get done with the deal. You explain the whole thing. You fill out all the paperwork. And at the very end, you're going to sign a contract, which is called an IOU. I-O-U, money. You're going to sign a contract that's called an IOU or a loan document. And the bank is going to take that IOU. And in exchange, the bank is going to give you money. Now, it's pretty rare with the exception of places like payday loan companies, it's pretty rare for banks to pay out those loans by actually giving you cash. Anybody who went down and took out a student loan to pay for fees, anybody who's gone down and taken out a loan to buy a car, they didn't peel off a whole bunch of hundred dollar bills to you. They gave you a check, maybe it was jointly payable to you in the regents, or they increased the balance in your checking account, which you then used to pay the, the car company. So the way in which you receive the funds, that money there, the way in which you receive the funds for that loan is typically by increasing the balance in your checking account and balances in checking accounts are money. So when the bank makes a loan and you take that loan out, you sign that IOU, they're gonna give you money, that's more money. That money didn't exist before, there's now more money in the economy, question. What's the difference between a credit card payment and asking for a loan? Um, when you use your credit card to, make a, to pay for something, uh, by virtue of them giving you that credit card, the credit card company has already agreed to give you loans up to whatever your balance is, and then you have the privilege of paying back that balance on what's called a rotating basis, revolving basis. When you use your credit card, you betcha. Yeah. If you don't pay off the full balance on your credit card, every month when your, when your credit card bill comes, you're going to pay interest probably between 15 and 30%, so depending upon what your credit record is. So, all right, so that's how banks make money. So when we say banks create money by making loans with their excess reserves, that's what we're talking about. Clicker question. Which of the following is not part of the money creation process? A, the amount of excess reserves that banks have. B, someone wanting to borrow money. C, banks making loans. D, the government printing currency. Or E, all of these are part of creating money. Which one of those is not part of the money creation process? A, B, C, D, or E? Three seconds. One, two, and three. No, it always, you know, when I say one, two, and three, it goes down. It was at like 94% when I said three seconds. And then it dropped to 86%. So the last, like, three seconds, everybody clicked the wrong answer. 80, so the government printing press is not part of the process of creating money. When the government prints money, they're simply replacing bills that have gone through the washing machine. The government printing press is about taking, you don't want one of those cruddy old bills in a birthday card. You want a nice crisp one in a birthday card. So they take the cruddy old ones that have gone through the washing machine and had all sorts of other abuse uh, rendered upon them, and they shred those, and then they replace them with new currency. That doesn't increase the amount of money. It just replaces old with new. The money creation process is banks creating money by making loans with their excess reserves. All right, so the Fed, we're back to the Fed. The Fed can impact how much money is created. 
If the Fed wants there to be more money in the economy, the Fed's going to increase the amount of excess reserves that banks have. So if the Fed decides, for reasons I haven't specified yet, if the Fed decides they want there to be more money in the economy, it's going to show up in the form of checking account balances. They'll increase the reserves the banks are holding. So there'll be more excess reserves. And when the Fed increases the amount of excess reserves, what's typically happening, what typically happens is banks will lend more, and that, of course, creates more money. If the Fed decides they want less money in the economy, the Fed's going to decrease the amount of excess reserves that are held by banks, and then the banks will lend less, and they won't create as much money. So the Fed can influence how much money banks are creating by changing how much excess reserves. Now, I said traditionally a few times, you might not have caught it, but I said traditionally a few times because traditionally what happens is that the banks, when they have excess reserves, because they're in the business of making profit, they lend out those excess reserves and they hold very little excess reserves. So here's a chart that shows you excess reserves from uh, I think 1984 here on the left to 2002 here on the right, showing you the levels of excess reserves. These are millions of dollars. Oh, I have to do my math here. So 2,000 million is 2 billion. So the total amount of reserves in the banking system is down here, hugging about uh, $1 billion. There's a few blips. There was a little blip here in 1991. Oh, my gosh, that at the time was huge. I remember spending, like, days talking about it in the money banking class that I taught back here in 1993 or 94. There was this big blip here in 2001. Oh, my gosh, that was huge. I remember talking about that for a day or so uh, in 100B sometime after 2001. But let me take this and run it forward because this is just 1984 to 2002. So, big blips. so here we have the same thing. I'll start in 1984 and run it through to today. Oh, where'd they go? Oh, there it is. Right there. See it? There's that big 2001 blip right there. Can you see it? Where's that 1991 blip? I don't know. It's in there someplace. It's there someplace. One of the characteristics of the crisis that began in 2007 is that banks are holding astronomical levels of excess reserves. For reasons we can't fully unpack or explain, the banks, instead of getting rid of those excess reserves by making loans and thereby making money, the banks have simply been holding on to those excess reserves. And so now we have, instead of $1 billion, we have about $3 trillion in excess reserves. Three trillion. Remember that we have an economy that has a GDP of around, let's say, $17 trillion. So the banks are holding reserves of $3 trillion. Oh my gosh, I have to do some math here. So if the total GDP is like $17 trillion, about 20% of that is investment, give or take, 20, 20, 20. So we've got about $3 trillion in investment spending. Most of these loans, I talked about the loans in terms of you all, most of the loans are actually made to businesses to underwrite investment spending. And so the banks are holding an amount of excess reserves that's equal to the entire amount of investment spending. It's huge. Those are loans they could have made, but they haven't. They're just sitting on those excess reserves uh, for reasons relating to the crisis, which we'll get to. Asymmetric information, I'll talk about it more in a couple of days. So how does the Fed change reserves? Well, typically, traditionally, oh, there's that word again, watch out. Traditionally, when the Fed wants to increase bank reserves, they buy treasury bills, which are IOUs from the federal government. The federal government has borrowed money and issued a treasury bill that says, I will, the federal government, I will pay you back. And so typically to increase bank reserves, what the Fed does is they buy these treasury bills from the banks and they pay for the assets they buy from the banks by giving them additional reserves. So the Fed says, hey, got some treasury bills, I'll buy them, and then pays for those treasury bills simply by increasing the balance in the bank's reserve account. That gives the bank more reserves, they can go and they can lend those. If they wanted to decrease bank reserves, they would do the opposite. The Fed would sell assets to the banks and the banks would exchange reserves for assets. So they would say, here, I've got uh, a shiny new Chevy to sell to you. That's an asset, they don't actually sell those. Uh, and the banks would pay for those by giving the Fed back some reserves. Question. Doesn't matter, just reserves. So the balance in their reserve account. No, it's not compulsory at all. It's totally optional on the part of the banks. So uh, the banks have a choice as to whether or not to buy or sell assets with the Fed. Not compulsory at all. All right, so let's look at the Fed's balance sheet. I told you that traditionally, oh, is this going to work? This is only going to work if my air bear is too connected, which we'll see. Hold on. Yay. Hot damn. Okay. So the link is there. You can do this on your own. I love how that explodes. I love that. Isn't that cool? I love how that does that. Um, so this is showing you the Fed's balance sheet. The little color down here, that's the traditional. That's what they traditionally buy is those treasury bills. One of the, you can't see the dates. This starts, this is about 2008. One of the characteristics of the crisis is that the Fed, in an effort to increase reserves, which have not been lent, the Fed has said to banks, whatever you've got, we'll buy it. So the Fed has been buying not just treasury bills. They've been buying mortgage-backed securities. They've been buying long-term treasuries. They've basically been buying any piece of paper that the banks would be willing to sell in an effort to increase reserves, which the banks aren't lending. More on Wednesday. See you then. Have a good day.